Hi, welcome everyone to another episode of Coffee and Codeless. And, you know, as a technologist, I, I love, of course, the art of the possible, what technology could do. I mean, that's how I grew up. I remember thinking back in the day, I think it was in like 93 and computer science class and talking to a technology called AWK, A-W-K for those around my generation, let's just say, but it was, it was very cool to be able to create almost your own friend or therapist using just language scanning. And of course, as everyone knows, like we're in a different age today and what the technology could do. Uh, one of the technologies we recently came across and are partners with, and we're so excited with the press release yesterday is rhino.ai. And with that, we have Adam and Harrison here. So you've, you guys, like this is not your first rodeo, you've, your first startup, you know, for those for those entering the startup world, there's those milestones, the, the one million dollar revenue mark and then 10 million and then the 100 million. And, you know, that 100 million revenue mark is it many times it's never achieved. It's one of those milestones, which is truly like respectable. And uh, these guys, their first business together, that's what they did. And that was um, an amazing exit. And this is this is now their, their next business. And I'm going to let Adam and uh, Harrison just give you, if you guys could do your intros and just um, tell us a little bit about yourself. And then let's let's talk about Rhino and what you guys are up to. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, great to be here, Gary. Um, it's been a long time. We've been friends of Encore for quite some time to be collaborating finally. Um, so back from now, so prior to um, starting Rhino, um, I co-founded two companies that I grew 400 million in revenue, the last of which ended up selling during the uh, start of the pandemic at ITG. Uh, we were basically an integrator that specialized in digital transformation. <clears throat> so with that is basically migrating legacy applications to cloud-based, low-code, new-code platforms. Did that for around 10 years, noticed that with the advancement in AI and machine learning, <clears throat> process mining, NLP, language parsing, uh, there were some opportunities to automate much of what we we're doing. Uh, companies could modernize with AI instead of armies for extensive consultants. Hey, I love it. Um, I love Harrison it. and, and like, technologists? Harrison, yeah, go ahead, please. Harrison. Um, can, you, can you hear us? Yeah, a little better. It was just breaking up a little bit there, but I think we're back. Cool. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so just a little background on myself. Like Adam said, we worked together back at ITG. Um, I was always trying to figure out how we could incorporate AI into more of our offerings. And uh, ultimately, after the sale of ITG, we went ahead and founded uh, Rhino. So basically, like Adam was saying, to tackle this problem of kind of in the same way, you know, platforms like Uncork, right, are trying to figure out how can we take the application infrastructure, you know, all the way from how we're hosting it up to how we have security, how we contain applications and automate a huge portion of that. So people aren't writing code for every layer of the application stack. How can we do that for application migration? So making sure instead of having so many consultants spending so many hours moving logic from place A to place B, how can we just do that automatically with AI? Yeah, and, and Harrison and Adam, technologists by background, like how, like what, what's your what's before even the startup? What's a business technology? What was your background? I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a technology background. Is more business, um, kind of a serial entrepreneur. Um, Harrison, the technologist here, he he actually started his career at Appian, so he's familiar with the low code space um, pretty extensively, and then started focusing on AI and machine learning. Awesome. And, and the word language, I got to ask. So like it's, you know, code equals language, a computer language. And um, I always like to say, I think I'm more proficient speaking programming languages than English. And or she says, well, good. I don't know what it is, but it's one of those. But, um, but you know, it's, it's really interesting that like the word language and what it's used. By definition, a computer language was created to let us communicate better with each other and our stakeholders as to what we're doing with technology, because of course the machines speak data. Like that's what they, the inputs, the outputs, the, so like how, how do you, how do you both think through language and your uses of AI to understand it? Cause you're, you're truly reversing languages, any language. And most of those are, you know, legacy technologies that are holding back customers and, and into like your definition of what that is. I'd love to, love to hear more. Yeah, absolutely. So language is really, the core of our offering, right? Uh, the platform as a whole is focused entirely on 
how can we represent these abstract structures which define applications, right? So workflows, business rules, APIs, integrations, all that different type of stuff, interfaces. And how can we represent those in formats that allow us to easily communicate those between all of these different platforms? You know, in the past, things like this have been done for the transactional data, right? So for stuff like, uh, you know, records in a database or in a spreadsheet or stuff like that. But this has kind of been neglected on the, the business workflow data, the kind of, you can almost think of it as the data that drives that data, right? The, the business rules, they're the data that tells the transactional data what to do. And that data has been neglected. It hasn't been thought about how to communicate it clearly. You know, each platform, like uh, Salesforce, Appian, ServiceNow, you know, and then of course, uh, no code platforms like yourself have their own way of expressing that data. And they're, it's created a huge problem where you basically have to pay humans so much money and so much time to figure out how to talk between them. And our goal is to basically allow the seamless translation between all of these different languages and data. Yeah, I, Harrison, wish you guys had this company when I was trying to, like I was handed a 1.2 million lines Lotus Notes app, the business created. <clears throat> And the end state was we we had to start over. Like we we couldn't understand because again, like it's one thing to write language well, and you have your ten x or engineers that that I would say do that. And I, I love the statistic. There's 18 million coders or engineers. Two thirds of them are self taught. So two thirds of them are just learning. Which, by the way, I, you know, I would say I was self taught as well. But like it's interesting to think if you how many of those are actually ten xers and could write well, and how many can't and um and then your technology would have basically magically taken those 1.2 million lines the business wrote themselves and translated it into business workflow and something we could then ingest and use i mean that's that's pretty amazing is uh and and you know the, the words lift and shift are always seen by technologists as uh where they don't want to be right so there's a lot of talk of cloud migrations and lifting and shifting those workloads to the cloud without any benefit. And you're just increasing security risk, you're increasing costs in many cases. You know, you, you're now giving those customers the ability to refactor. Like that's the way I would kind of view, view your world is we get to take, instead of lifting and shifting, it's a really refactor it for the future instead. Is that how you would think? I'm curious your thoughts on that. Absolutely. So, you know, at a high level, we view ourselves as operating at that process. And the first is the abstraction and the third is the transformation, right? So pulling that logical definition out and pushing it to the target platform. But in the middle, there's the refactoring. And what we do is when we house the logic inside of Rhino that we've extracted, we hold in what we call our universal application notation format, which is really similar to, you know, an idea to a codeless architecture that on um, Quark uh, uses, except it's more focused on migration versus application execution and definition. And that's where people have the advantage to, you know, use Rhino since it's pulled out all the logic from their business to look at all of their applications, flag where the bad practices are, you know, for example, loops and processes, denormalized data, you know, redundant business rules, bad security models, and then make changes to those before they transform into the target system so that they're not just lift and shifting their legacy junk, but they're making a better to be state for the target platform. And what this means is, as an enterprise, they haven't just improved by, by migrating to a modernized superior platform, for example, going from Lotus Notes to Uncork, but they've also improved their business processes and the technical implementations of those business processes along the way. That's one of the big areas as well, where we're integrating generative uh, AI into our platform is to help with the recommendation of the process improvements that can be made in between the extraction of the legacy logic and the transformation of the modern business logic. Yeah, and, and Harrison, I love this because um, we get asked probably every five minutes about generative AI and how we think they're, it's, it's really interesting. And so there was a cartoon that was going around LinkedIn the other day and it, uh, it definitely caught my eye. It was the, um, there was someone on the left side of the screen talking to someone else over the computer and says, hey, look, I wrote these three bullet points and, you know, chat GPT just created it into this long email I'm sending the customer. <laughs> And on the right side of the screen was the customer saying, hey, look, I just received this long email and ChatGPT reversed it into these <laughs> bullet points. And, and the reality was like, that's, and so it's funny because that when you're describing Harrison, what you're doing, like I, 
my view of generative AI is it's amazing and it should have nothing to do with generating code. Like to me, it's like, that's where my message is very simple, which is generative AI is amazing technology for understanding language intent and actually translating that to, in my opinion, and what you described data. That's what you're doing is you're, you're able to get that intent and language into those bullet points of data, really the essence. And to us, our whole platform is data. Like we, we are, you know, we call it data defined software. It's kind of like it's software that's running on that data. So it, you don't need to do that extra translation back to that long email and what you're describing, which is what I love about Rhino today and what you've done. Like that to me is the magical part. I mean, that's the, like, and I can just imagine like you're, you're taking all these legacy systems that, you know, I used to say 80% of my budget was spent just keeping the lights on running these systems you know, the, the, the file nets out there, the, you know, and all these systems, the tip goes, which we were using at city and you like all that, imagine being able to actually bring that in and ingest it and then reverse it into something which is meaningful. And, and I've tried, I remember at some point I gave a vendor, like, um, I think it was 2 million lines of assembler and said, translate it to Java. And what came back was 4 million lines of Java, which we called Jobal because it was basically Java, but it was that you couldn't understand or maintain it or use it. It was unusable. And what you've built is the exact opposite, which is getting that into the meaningful form, getting it into the essence. That's, that's amazing. That is, uh, yeah. And what are you hearing from your customers? What, what's your feedback of like, the, you know, as you're going through this and driving it? So we have mutual customers. It is, you know, we see it, we hear it, we're pushing and like, this is, we, we see that your technology bringing it into a codeless data defined world is the future. There's no question. I'm curious, like the excitement you're seeing as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing the customers see is just the improvements in the speed and the cost, right? And you know, I sometimes would wish they would see it more in the, the terms you're describing, right? But the first thing is like, wow, they see the effects of it, right? They see, okay, because we have abstracted out code and requirements into data. And, you know, we have this raw, you know, um, easy to understand form of what our business objectives are that can be pushed to all these platforms. They see how much more quickly they're able to modernize by, you know, kind of looking at this data centric, requirement centric, intent centric view of the world versus the old kind of like code centric view of the world. So that's, that's probably the first part of that uh, that they see. It's like, wow, everything's so much faster. We're able to migrate so much more quickly. You know, um, the applications are higher quality because they're more closely aligned with our objectives, right, and our intent and the language we use to describe those intents versus, you know, just right. some, like you said, Java or assembler commands, right? Um, that's, I think that's the first thing they see. I think also it's like you were talking about, you know, um, from the data standpoint, it's the ability to visualize their enterprise in a different way than I think they've been able to in the past. Uh, for example, you know, you think about something like process mining, why it was such a big deal. It's basically automating a lot of the business analysis work for processes. We view ourselves as kind of the next step past that, right? So it's how can I uh, sort through, draw insights from, you know, and understand not just process, but the entire uh, technical ecosystem and the application ecosystem. So what are our rules that we operate by? What is the general process we go by? What is the data, you know, the, the main data elements we're tracking and how do our systems and our different processes communicate with each other? And so that's where by pulling all of that out together, a business can then start to see like, wow, these are my efficiencies. These are in my inefficiencies. And overall, like, this is what I do. Because we often see with a lot of the large enterprises, sometimes it's not super clear to them, you know, what exactly is going on and what they're doing. So I think both that speed, the cost reduction, but also the ability to understand their own business in a way they haven't been able to do so before are some of the main you know, positive feedback that we're getting from the vendors and clients we work with. You know, that I've never thought about that. That is, um, that's fascinating, by the way. So um, I had a project in a previous CIO role where we were, we had 85 different commission systems to pay agents and brokers within my portfolio, 85 different complete enterprise systems. Each one, I would call its own snowflake, right? Its own... Some of them, some of them were written in technologies like Clipper 87, somewhere in COBOL, somewhere in Java, somewhere in .NET, didn't matter what it was, somewhere vendor packages, somewhere low code packages. But, you know, we said that we're going to get down to one and we'll pick one destination, one target. 
what you're describing, if that was available when we did this, would have given us the insight across the 85 existing to kind of reverse those intents to structure and architect the one so that it doesn't have any of the issues. Because I've seen, I've seen, you know, the monolithic, um, you know, bank in a box approach to say, we're going to build this one bank and we're going to build it, I'm going to say in Singapore, and then it's going to be rolled out to 102 countries and it's going to be, it'll, it'll handle every banking need for all these different customers and institutions. And then it flops. The reality is it can't get out of its first country because no one did the scan to say what's needed, what's the other, and that's, by the way, that's that's not process mining, that's like, I, you need a name for that, by the way, so that's, you're gonna have to name that, but that's- We're still um, working on it. Like what they're yeah, called, you know, logic mining, you know, it's, uh, it, the name's- You should progress. go ask ChatGPT, I've been asking ChatGPT a lot just for naming help lately. We, we use like, it a lot, it actually created our logo. <laughs> <laughs> did it really? Did it? Sorry, Dolly. <laughs> That's not ChatGPT. Dolly, Dolly did. did. Um, so we did a LinkedIn Live. One of the recent ones we did was, um, you know, we had an Encore app talking to both ChatGPT, Dolly, and then Amazon recognized. And you could literally say, describe a situation that generates the image and then recognize rates, how well they did. Um, you know, which is looking at the, you know, oh, I see a person, I see a briefcase, it must be work, it must be, and it was, uh, it was, it was actually a good, good exercise to see how you connect all these things. But um, what is, what is your, um, Adam, you, you and Harrison, what are your impressions of generative AI, the buzz? Um, what, what is your thought process there? I'm curious. Well, there's like two thoughts of, of uh, here. One is, you know, Doom and gloom is the end of the world, and they're going to take over everything, which not necessarily uh, far fetched. Uh, but but the other is, you know, how do we coexist with, you know, is software development over? Are people going to lose their jobs? Um, I think we're far from that. Um, but I think that if if you don't incorporate it, and if you are a, a software platform that does not incorporate AI into it, you're going to be falling far behind. Um, and we've seen everyone kind of jumping on the bandwagon. I think it's going to be um, it's going to be interesting to see in the next six months how how things shake out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, I just want to add to that. Like, I think that you know, from a generated AI standpoint, I don't think the technology world has ever been about to has ever been in this turbulent state as it's probably about to enter. You know, I think things are going to be changing very quickly. A lot of businesses are going to be asking themselves questions like. What is our value proposition now, right? Not because all their value propositions have been eroded, but because everything has changed. You know, um, what is the, you know, what exactly, if you have a platform, what does the platform provide versus what the generative AI provides, which I think you articulated, you know, uh, started to articulate earlier with, you know, your view on Encore, housing the data, which could then be generated by a generative AI, right? As opposed to having a generative AI just write a bunch of code and then no one understands what's going on. Uh, same thing with services companies. What are they providing, right? If you're if you're a large SI, right? What are what is your value prop now? And I think the companies that kind of come out of this are going to be the ones that can really look ahead and understand what is their offering now. And I think from our perspective, right, uh, in the same way that you know, on Cork, I think you were describing as a platform that is going to hold the data and that will drive the business applications we're holding that data, that language that drives the migrations. And generative AI is the injection point that in addition to users injecting their, their intent, generative AI can refine and inject its version of the intent, which can then be surrounded by the guardrails of a platform to you know, make sure you have scalability, auditability, you know, safety, all of those different features. And that now that intent generated by the machine can be automatically uh, used to migrate applications. So. I, yeah, I, I love the vision. That's our thought. Harrison, I love, like, like to me, like I, um, I first got a demo of cloud in 2007 when, you know, it was literally Jeff Bezos and Vertivova, like they were in city when I was a CIO there and like demoing this concept, which wasn't called cloud. And all I kept thinking was like, from a business point of view, you described a strategy. It's it, like, are we as a bank in the business of infrastructure? The answer should be no. The answer should be is, we don't, if we have world-class infrastructure, how does that separate us apart from everyone else? It doesn't. Like, that's not the, we're a bank. Like, where's, how do we serve our customers and how, and that thought process, once you start looking at that thought process, a cloud migration looks like it's a strategy discussion. It's a focus discussion. It's like, we aren't going to be the best in infrastructure that someone else already is. We're going to focus on being the best at what separates us. And once you do that, 
cloud cloud becomes your destination, but everyone I see is stuck. I mean, what I don't know what the latest numbers are, like five or ten percent of the cloud workload has been done. Like, and there, um, what I love about Red Hat AI is there has been no tool before to help. There's no, like, no one wants to say I want the tool for lift and shift. Like that's not, but. But like, and we we do view ourselves as the layer above the cloud. As an inf- we're an infrastructure layer. We're boring. We're like this engine that sits above it, and we're cloud agnostic. But once Rana Data extracts your logic and puts it into that data definition, you're in the cloud, and you're now secure, and you're getting benefits. That's that's probably the biggest thing is how do you communicate the benefits of cloud? And I've seen boards, I, I, I've seen a board once say we're migrating the app to the cloud, and once we do, we're going to get better data. And analytics from it, and like, and then you looked, and they were doing literally just like um, it was a .NET conversion from one version to another. And you ask the questions, and you suddenly realize that there is no benefit. There is no. They're not going to get more data. They're they're actually they're in the wrong track. They're going to increase security concerns in their case. That's why th- this approach you're doing here is is amazing. And uh, I like someone said, cloud becomes your destination. I like, I like the comments. If there aren't, by the way, I should have said this early on. If there are any questions for Adam or Harrison, you you know, definitely throw it into the, uh, the, the comment section. I'll do my best to ask it. Um, I love the alignment of the visions though here. And so, and when did you, um, like Adam, when did you create Rana Day? When was the, when was your move? And I know you've been stealth. So it's nice to see you come out of that. Stuff. So tell us, yeah. Yeah, so during, um... In my in our previous company, um, actually, this is a pretty funny uh, anecdotal story. Um, JC, my old COO, uh, which you've met, has um, uh, over and over told me you cannot do product and services under the same umbrella. And I was like, you know what? Maybe you guys couldn't do it in your previous company. I can do it. So we created this product. It was for energy disaggregation, cool product, failed miserably. Not because it was a bad product, but uh, it was just, you know, the, the people got poached by Google. Um, it, you know, th- he was like, either the, the product or the services is going to suffer. And he was right. They were both suffering. So pulled the plug on that and said, you know what, let's just focus on the services. And then when the time is right, we'll just go all in on a product. And, uh, and so we kind of saw that there's a lot of inefficiencies in how you're migrating a uh, legacy application. We were doing a lot of that. That's all we specialized in. And we were doing it mostly manually at that time. Um, so we saw some, you know, the progress in machine learning and process mining and, and AI um, and kind of started to think about how can we uh, automate a lot of the stuff that we were doing. And so the goal was to, um, do at the very minimum 50% of what we're doing manually to automate. Um, in some cases, it's worked as, as much as 90% some of the clients that we have right now. So um, yeah, it was pretty pretty exciting time for us to, to dive in right after, uh, especially with, with COVID, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, we actually got into Y Combinator. Um, you're familiar with Y Combinator. And it was one of their first uh, Y Combinator cohorts during the pandemic, we ended up turning them down, but uh, it was more of a validation that, you know, we were on the right track to do something cool. Oh, I love that story. I like the, uh, and you guys drove it yourself then from that point of view. And that's uh, yep. why Common is great, great incubator. And uh, it's also great when you know that you could do this without that. And, yep. you know, you know, the vision, you validate. That's, that's awesome. I, uh, again, like anyone, anyone watching, like you're doing, I've seen project plans for the 12 to 18 month cloud migrations, right? So like here's, and, um, and it's a great business for a lot of the uh, strategic integrators. Um, but if you're the client, like, and like, I would definitely say, reach out, reach out to Rhino today. I'm assuming your website is the best place to go and just, just follow up from there. Uh, it is. You know, tag Adam and Harrison on LinkedIn for follow for sure. Uh, we are always help, uh, you know, always there to help as well. And uh, basically, we we love to be the destination, and that's we we hope to be your premier destination in the cloud is what we're going to be. And that's the that we are the only data defined destination, I should say. Maybe that's what we go is DDD, um, data defined destination. That's a good place to be. And uh, and and Adam and Harrison, thank you for for coming on. Um, so I think there's one question I'm asking them. How can the 
dev shops use AI and ChatGPT to automate analysis, innovation, execution? Any any last thoughts? And then uh, we'll make that the last question. But um, so DevOps use AI and ChatGPT to automate analysis, innovation, and execution. Yeah, basically, I mean, from an analysis standpoint, uh, AI tools, you know, whether you're, you're using us or, you know, whatever ultimately uh, solution that the client picks need to be part of the analysis of the business. Uh, I think that the slow migration plans that you just talked about have demonstrated that just having the employees or members of a team analyze hundreds of legacy apps will never be able to allow them to successfully extract the intent. You know, most of the, most, or at least a huge portion of migrations fail, right? Or they take forever, they go over budget. And that's because at the end of the day, you know, one human being is not going to be able to read through, you know, as you said before, like your example of like a million lines of Lotus script and figure out what the heck that's supposed to be. But machines can now at least. And so it must, I would I not only say, can they be part of it? They must be part of it. You should be feeding the technical artifacts, the documentation, legacy requirements. All of these need to be getting ingested by machines so that they can tell you what the intent is. And that intent can be converted to data. And that data can then be moved to platforms like on Quark, where it can be used to execute and control modern applications. I, I love it, Harrison. I just keep picturing, you know, looking at the engineer as they're writing code and being able to tell them the intent and verify it and be, and then, uh, and then being able to match that against the business requirement. And the business requirement might've been spoken to ChatGPT and said, Mike, go, might go back to that long email and breaking it down to these points, which now you can validate. And, uh, and of course we eliminate the code in between after it goes to destination. And that's where we're in a great spot. This is amazing. I really, I really appreciate Adam, you and Harrison coming on. I appreciate your partnership and the press release that went out yesterday is giving such great news and just appreciate um, where we're going forward as partners. Thank you for joining me today. Awesome. On, uh, Thank you. Another Coffee and Codeless. Thanks so much. Right. Take, care. Take care. Have a good day. Thanks Bye. for having us.